Hello, hello. So I decided to make a holder, a long time needed holder for some of my sharpening stones. So I found a piece of solid surface. This thing's been laying outside for a number of years. Took it to my shop sink, washed it off and did a careful layout. Let's take it into the shop and get started. All right, so I've got my measurements here. I'll just do a quick layout. Uh, this first one is 2.76, about two and three quarter. I'm gonna go, let's see, two and three quarter by eight and a quarter, so I can mark eight and a quarter. Let's see what that is, it's about, yeah, it's about three inches, so we'll go inch and a half from the end. Describe. Set it. Put it in there. All right, inch and a half. And I can go inch and a half from this end as well. And uh, let's see, 2.76, that's about two and three quarter. And this is just a rough layout. I'm gonna be accurate with the shaper. And then I'm gonna go about two inch space here. And then, then I have two more that are 2.9, which is about three inches. Go a little under three, boom. And then two inch space, and then a little under three. So roughly that's where they go really just so I can lay out and put tape, but with the shaper, I'll do a grid and establish X and Y axis off of here and here. So I'm, you know, putting these exactly where I need to. Yeah. Now I'm probably that guy that uses more tape than I need. See, the machine will tell you if you don't have enough, but I want the machine to be able to read what I'm doing. For those of you that aren't familiar with solid surface, you may have heard the term Corian. It's essentially a plastic. It's a man-made product, it's typically used for countertops. It's very hard, very durable. This particular piece was outside for a number of years and part of it was buried in the dirt and no sun tan, no sun bleach. I actually had it on one of the corners of my house to keep the sprinkler from hitting the siding. It's non-porous, waterproof, and should be perfect for this. Once the tape is down, I can go to scan and then new scan, right? And hit the start scan button. And the machine or computer is reading those marker, that mar the marker tape and triangulating its position in a digital 3D world. And Sean with Shaper showed me that I can move the machine off of the workspace so it can capture the workpiece closest to me and it will be in the picture or on the screen later when I go to place the file or to create. Does that make sense? It will in a minute. And now I can create what's known as a grid right on the machine so I know where the edge is closest to me and an adjacent edge which is also known as the XY axis which is based on the Cartesian system I believe. <laughs> so with a bit drop down here, I went to locate my first location and the machine reminded me to check my bit size. So I need to remember that it is a quarter inch, so 0.25. Then it moves to the next position or I move the bit to the next position on the edge. Push the button. And then I can go around the corner to establish the Y axis. So hopefully that made sense. The bit is slightly hanging down and contacting the edge and that's how the machine reads its location, its precise position, I should say, in relation to the marker tape. And here I'm simply flipping the router bit in its correct orientation. So initially the router bit was installed intentionally upside down with just the shank protruding from the collet. So this is where it gets fun. And we're gonna go into create mode and start plugging in some of the parameters. So we can choose rectangle and then let me grab my measurements and we're going to go with the width and that is 
eight and a quarter, so 8.25, right? And then the height. And this is measured right off the stone, 2.766. So I'll just plug that in. And then another aspect of this machine that I love, choosing an anchor point, right? You can see the nine choices there, and we're gonna go with a lower right corner. Let me grab my tape measure, and right there is inch and a half from that right edge. You can see it on the screen, and I can just bring it over till it uh, pulls up 1.5. So inch and a half from each edge right there. And boom, push place. And <laughs> it's in position. How cool is that? Now to start, I'm gonna go with depth of cut at uh, 1 16th of an inch, 0 0.0625, right? And then um, for an inside or outside or pocket, we need to hover over the line or the path of cut and choose inside. And then we'll go with bit size, which is 1 8 right? And then uh, Z-Touch, let the machine Figure out that parameter on its own. Dropping down. Boom, there it is. And I think I forgot the offset, but looks like I can uh, set that at 10 thousandths offset for now. Now, if you're already familiar with the shaper, this may be boring to you, but I don't know. I watch woodworking videos all the time where I'm already familiar with the process, and I always learn a little something, some tidbit of information. So yeah, hopefully you do too. Nice, got that cut. Let's vacuum up this huge mess. And let's see how we did. And actually, I don't even know why I'm checking this. The machine cut exactly the numbers that I, that I put in, right? And I need to fire my camera guy. He's kind of shaky and out of camera frame. But I'll show you something a little bit. Uh, a cool little fixture that I that I purchased recently. It's going to make this a lot better. All right, so here I had plugged in that 10 thousandths offset. I'm going to change that to zero offset. And I can go ahead and set the final depth of 330 seconds deep and make another cut. I'm in auto mode, and right here I moved the router a little bit faster than the speed that was set, so I just change that back to the default of 10, which I believe is 10 inches per minute, maybe. And I typically like my forearms resting on the table. I think you have better control with the router, so I really should have moved the solid surface back to achieve that next time. <laughs> And so you can see how I sometimes will use my fingers to pull or push the router rather than just hanging onto the grips and moving it sideways like that. It gives you a little bit more control. You might try that. All right, so at this stage, it's literally lather, rinse, repeat, right? Placed another file, the second rectangle, I should say. It's not really a file because it's just on board. And boom, there you can see one and a half from the right edge and six and a quarter from the bottom. So the plan is to cut three different cavities, two different size stones. So the first one's cut in, that's one size, and then I can simply copy the tool path for the second one to create the third one. So for something like this, of course this distance is inch and a half, and I've already laid this out. I don't need to be crazy accurate, but uh, 11 and... 11 and a quarter to this edge. So 11 and a quarter and inch and a half to this corner to place my other object. Let me move this back here. So you can see it on the screen there. Kind of hard to do one hand is, but I can get it over there, inch, inch and a half. And then 11 and an eighth, let me go a little more, 11 and a quarter, right there. And then you can see the, the place button or this button, boom. It's in place. And so I'll probably have to rotate 
this a little bit just so it can see the tape there. If it's not enough tape, I could get some more of this thickness and add more tape and then do an add to scan. So a lot of options with this machine to, to create. Yeah, man. So I did exactly that. Another piece of solid surface and more tape. So then I can go uh, back to scan mode and add to scan. And then scan in those last two pieces of tape. That's pretty cool. You know, if you cut your tape or you don't have enough or it gets damaged or whatever, you can just add to scan and it remembers your prior tape layout and just adds more. That's awesome. So I can scan those last two pieces and let the machine update. Pretty cool, yeah? All right, I didn't know where to squeeze this in in the video, so here it is. I got this sign arm, and Sean with Shaper Origin was telling me about them. They're fantastic if you want to mount an iPhone and record what's showing on your screen. So from now on, my close-up shots should be better. So thanks for the info, Sean, and I will leave a link in the description on where to find this. I'm also waiting on a quick release by Condor Blue, but everything's back-ordered right now. All right, so that's first part of these cavities cut. And if I place this over that or even measure with a mic, it dial calipers, they look really close, but it doesn't matter. I can always come back and cut that bigger. As long as I don't move the tape, I still have my work, pe my work piece, work area, work space. There you go. <laughs> I knew there was work in there somewhere. So as long as I don't move any of this, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, a pocket cut and change bits, put a quarter inch bit, cut on the perimeter, inside perimeter of all of these. And then I can even use a different router and to hog it out even quicker because I can use a different router with a bigger bit, hog out the inside and then start fitting these. If I don't like the way they fit, then I can just simply adjust it right on screen for a few more thousandths and make it slightly bigger until these drop in. That's pretty fabulous, yeah? So I'm changing the bit, putting it in a quarter inch. I think this is a down cut, but uh, an up cut would actually work better for something like this. And then here I'm going into pocket mode. You can see the pocket is kind of clarified by this diamond plate looking screen. And same as before, and it looks like I'm freehand, but the shaper won't let me go outside the designated parameter. Right, you can see I have a three quarter bit in there and I'm just gonna drop this down until it just makes contact somewhere in there, boom. And then I've set up a few of these feeler gauges to equal 0 0.094, three 30 seconds. And bring the plunge rod depth stop down till that locks and that's how deep I'll go. And I'll just watch this. I have quite a bit of space because of the pocket cut I did with a quarter inch bit. So I just need to stay away from there and hog all this out. And then we can start checking the stones. Yeah. So I decided to take this outside. I'm going to take this loose. It's held down with sticky tape, right? Uh, double sided tape as is that one. So if I need to re trim this, it doesn't matter that I move this because I've got the tape here. However, I did add to scan with this tape. So this does need to go back in place. So I can index it this way pretty easily. So I'm just going to clamp a block of wood down right here. That way I can put it back pretty much exactly where it is now. So it's not super critical what I'm doing, but I think this will be plenty accurate. I can take this guy loose. Oh, hey, I just wanted to show this to you real quick. So what I have here is a 1 16th, an eighth inch, and a quarter inch bit, and then the two collets, collets. One of them is, is an eighth inch collet, which is super handy for micro bits. And the real reason I showed you that is because I ended up putting a 1 16th inch bit so I could make smaller corners. So yeah, the shaper is super forgiving and user friendly. So the vacuum on my routers isn't that great. So anytime I have to do some routing, 
if I can, I just go outside. It just, eh, it's easier, cleaner. All right, check it out. Let me move these guys. Don't need that anymore. Because... Hose. There's this guy, and boom. Beautiful. This one's almost tight, um, but it fits. Beautiful, perfect. How's that? Just love it, man. So now I can uh, cut this to size and uh, I don't know, maybe put some rubber feet on the bottom to uh, keep it from sliding. So that is very cool. Oh, and by the way, solid surface makes an ideal material for engraving. That's my logo. My beautiful lady loves panda bears, but um, yeah, perfect. So I always get asked what my sharpening methods are. You know, I use, I, I sharpen by hand. I use guides. I use a Tormek. It just depends on what I'm doing, how I'm feeling, etc. Sometimes I'll get into a session and I'll just sharpen everything I have and I'm looking for more things to sharpen. Uh, typically, it's uh, just these diamond plates and uh, Shapton glass stone. If I need to re-grind something, Tormek all the way. If I'm wanting to put a slight camber on a plane blade, then I use a honing guide. So lots of ways to do things. Find what works for you and stick with it. And I like to tell people that are just starting out a couple of things that, you, that are paramount. First is make sure the back is dead flat, polished or near mirror finish, right? And when you start to sharpen, you have to have a burr. You have to feel the burr. No burr, no sharp, right? Feel the burr, move it back and forth from the front to the back until it's until it disappears and it's gonna be sharp. It's, it's really not that tricky. Oh, and I almost forgot, solid surface, you can go to some countertop shops will have remnants and probably give it to you or it's gonna be really cheap. Pennies, if not dollars. <laughs> I really like these Shapton glass stones. They, they need flattened quite often, maybe not as much as a water stone, but they, they still need flattened. And check out that glint of light. Love it. And this little dude is a little challenging to sharpen. But uh, since it's small, it happens relatively quick. This is my little shoulder veritas. A little veritas shoulder plane matches that bigger one laying down on the bench. Awesome. And yeah, I use it. Super handy. So initially, I had planned on making this bridge to go across my shop sink. But I thought, eh, let's just keep it simple. It's quick and easy to break out. I have a few stones, but the ones I use primarily are a 600 grit, a 1200 grit diamond, and then an 8000 and a 16000 grit Shapton glass. So, yeah, super glad I made this thing. Awesome. Got all my hand planes sharpened, and I use all of these except for the two old ugly ones in the corner that joiner plane needs. The sole needs milled to make it flat and square to the edges. But all these others, I absolutely use. And does anybody know what those are for? <laughs> I bet you do. Oops, forgot this little dude and he lives right there. Well, that is it for this video, Shaper Sharpening Holder. You know, this was a simple task for the Shaper Origin and I'm so glad I made it and thrilled that you came along. Thanks a ton for watching. <laughs>